Hi, this is Meg Gardner, author of The Dark Corners of the Night, and you are enjoying The Thriller Zone with David Temple. I gotta tell you something, you are uh, you have the classiest backdrop uh, I've seen. Well, thank you. It took me a while to realize that if we were always gonna be like Zooming, I needed to get rid of all the stacks of junk that were in my office and like actually make it look like it was a, a place where a grown up could sit. <laughs> for yeah. a little bit. I used to, I followed rate my Skype room right. on Twitter, which was rate my Skype room, which would like, it would judge. It was just extremely judgy about people's zoom backgrounds. So I, um, I decided I would clean up my act. So. I heard about that. I've actually had people say, you know, uh, and this is back when I was just doing audio, they said, you know, um, and I tried my hand at the video and just, it was miserable. They said, you know, you actually can get rated by this company. I'm like, what? Oh yeah. It wasn't, yeah. It wasn't a company. It's just, it's just a dude out there of, of just being um, either snarky or, or happy. <laughs> oh, 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 I thought it was like a, a, some kind of official. Like if you pass this, that you were some kind of, you were in the, uh, the cool crowd. No, well, no, there's just a dude, a dude, a dude on Twitter who calls it rate my Skype room and he posts, posts pictures and says that this one looks like your background looks like a hostage video where this one looks like you're like. <laughs> Yours is nice and cool. I like the depth. I like the colors. I like the lamp. And, uh, you know, it's very clean, very. Yes. There you go. It's well, I think got the microphone. Uh, I like the microphone. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say, why don't you use one of your fancy microphones? I'm like, I don't know. It's sometimes you have all this equipment like i'm not even going to spin the camera around here because you'll i'll be embarrassing myself but there's a camera set up like an official camera and a teleprompter stand and a monitor but i'm like you know sometimes you just want to keep things simple good good anyway but yeah that's the new uh that's the new voiceover booth that just came in from spain oh wow so that is, uh, you can get in there. You, it's like 99.5% silent, mm -hmm. except when Dexter decides to get. Right. As long as there's no lock on the inside, you're good. Oh no, Meg. <laughs> so my wife and I. Nothing on it. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Let me out. No. It okay. works perfectly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So my wife's helping me put it together. This was a scene out of um, stupid home videos or something. Uh, God, it, it, when you're in the middle of something, do, you know, getting the flow and you're just really cranking away and you're not thinking about what you're doing. And I have a video of this, so I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself later. I'm gonna compile this time-lapse of me putting this mm -hmm. thing together. And at one point, uh, it, 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 put, it pull, uh, fits together like a Lego. And I, I'm standing inside it and I'm like, honey, quick, help me with this door because the door weighs about 1,700 pounds. And we're like, oh, yeah, let me get on the inside. And she lifts it up and great. And, I, and I'm working away, putting the walls up. All of a sudden, I, I'm halfway up the walls and I realize I'm inside. The <laughs> I can't actually, yeah, mm -hmm. we don't have a ladder. So I'm. <laughs> I had to disassemble the door locking so I could get out, come in, and mm -hmm. anyway. I, this I is mean, why we hire contractors. <laughs> writers write, contractors contract. Mm -hmm. Yes. Voiceover. Carpenters, uh, there's a reason they know how to how to use yeah. the hammer correctly. <laughs> Last time I saw you was Warwick's in La Jolla. Mm hmm and I think we were talking about, well, it could have, no, it had to have been uh, the dark corners of the night. What? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, great turnout. Always fun. fantastic. You were delightful. Well, thank you. I was so happy that you came. I was, it's always, it's always like, is there going to be anybody there? You know, they could have one seat set up and you just stare at it. Yeah. That, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not sure who that hack was that was with you. Some guy, he wandered in off the street and I asked him if he'd be, if he, I told him I'd buy him a slice of pizza if he'd sit in the other chair, yeah. That homeless guy really knows how to interview. Yeah, just lucky me. <laughs> Don Winslow, he, I'm telling you what, man, he, uh, 
I, I find myself gushing entirely too much about that guy. Uh, there's just mm -hmm. something about him that you can't not like, but isn't he a sweetheart? He is, he's, and he's extremely generous. He's been very generous and helpful to me and I appreciate it more than I can say, yeah. He, uh, you know, he lives 55, lives an hour from here. I know. I know. I mean, he had to drive. He, yeah, he he drove all the way out to, to La Jolla, which I think he would have rather sat at home and done it by Zoom. But he was extremely <laughs> generous. I don't know. I think I think he likes the limelight. I got to see him also another. Uh, let's see. It was after that. Got to see him and Adrian McKinty at uh, the Mystery Shop. Mysterious uh, Bookshop in uh, New York. Oh. Yeah. No, he's great. great. I mean, he's got he's got a very he's got a he's an excellent raconteur. So uh, so yeah. He um, he loves to. He's I, I never knew he was such a kidder until you you put him in a room with like Adrian and they're just. Oh gosh, yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. Anyway, so back to work. So what have you been doing? First of all, how did how did COVID go and treat you? Let's start there. And and what have you been doing since? Dark Likewise, uh, Warwick says you. I'm sure you. This was the same for you. That was. I mean. After that, every day it got weirder and weirder until, you know, um, uh, by the time I was, you know, the next week as I was coming home from the end of book stuff, I, you know, the, the jokes had stopped and I was calling my husband frantically and saying, you know, like, get a machete, go to the supermarket and start stocking up now because if you wait till I get off the plane, <laughs> we're going to starve. Um, so then, uh, you know, everything, I, I stayed, I stayed home. I stayed home for, for, for 15 months and it was, um, I'm fine. We, we, we've stayed healthy. We're vaccinated. Um, everybody in my family has stayed healthy so far. Uh, the two out of the three kids are, have, are, are fully vaccinated. Um, the, 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 the third is in England and waiting for his second dose. Uh, but, you know, it became, it got, I got cabin fever. I, I felt like a, a squirrel trapped in a in a hollow tree. After a while, it was just it was it was just crazy. But on the other hand, I kept thinking I'm scattered. I'm unfocused. I'm not going to be able to do anything. And I, I I was hugely productive when I look back on it. Which I guess okay, lock me in my office and tell me if I step outside, <laughs> I'll, I'll turn, I'll die. Then I guess maybe I'll sit down and write. Right. <laughs> How about you? Well, it's so funny. People have asked me on a, a several occasions, oh my God, David, how are you doing? Oh, I'm like, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. I sit inside a room all day writing and I sat inside a room all day writing. I think the yeah. only thing is I didn't go to, I've got a couple of favorite coffee shops nearby and I've, the Encinitas Public Library, which mm -hmm. if you've never seen it is stunning. And it sits on a cliff and it oversees the, it is one of the best views in town. So I, I tend to sit there and just kind of gaze. Oh, yeah. So that was gone. Mm -hmm. But no, and we're healthy and we haven't had a, a blip in the screen. Luckily, Tammy's job allows her to work in and out of home. So mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of a piece of cake. And I, 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 I caught a couple of my friends who were who are writers who said, uh, I said, you know, so come on, tell me what you've been working on. Well, yeah, you know, so distracted by all the COVID that I couldn't really write, and I'm like, but it's you're 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 purposely. I, I, I have I have yeah. At first, I felt like that. I was just kind of like, what's going on? What's going on? And I was just right. you know addicted to to whatever the latest findings and research and everything was. But then eventually, deadlines are are wonderfully focusing. So uh, that was that was possibly one of the reasons it was. Uh, so helpful. My husband also has, he, he works at home. He travels quite a bit, but uh, has is primarily, uh, he's in tech and he had already primarily been working remotely, but we realized that if we were both here full-time 24 seven, 365, that our work styles in adjacent rooms are, are extremely diff different. But um, thank God I discovered uh, noise canceling headphones. Oh. <laughs> Aren't they the best? Unbelievable, fabulous. Uh, and you know what? I, I am looking forward to this. Do you have the Do you have the Bose, or do you I have, have the I have the Beats Solo Pro, which uh, which uh, where I oh yeah, fantastic. 
And do you, okay, yeah. So it's about the same thing. That This little springy thing can get a little uh, crazy after multiple hours because you're well, yeah. <laughs> getting your head crushed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, oh. So, that was that was a godsend when I found, I don't know who turned me on to those, but mm -hmm. but I should yeah I should write to Dr. Dre and tell him he had saved my marriage, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, Meg, I'm not sure Dr. Dre had much to do with it. Well, with ah. the beats, with the beats, uh, the other yeah. uh, anyway. I, I, but yeah, yeah. He's, the only, he's the only name I've got. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Tammy uh, Tammy works in her office, uh, aka bedroom down the hall so fortunately we have two doors and a sliding door in between but when she's on zooms and i'm on zooms um you know we just try to keep our because it's mine is all fun this is all fun and yay and laughing mm -hmm. and she, hers is like hers is business and so tell yeah. me doctor so and so yeah well, and I should, I mean, yeah, we can, we can complain as long as, as long as we want. All my kids are out of the house. I was not also running, you know, multiple Zoom classrooms, right. <laughs> trying to get the bandwidth and, and run a small business. Uh, so we're, we're fine. We're absolutely fine. I've been able to travel now, get out to see my mom, get out to see my daughter. So uh, life is okay. Nice. Where is mom? Mom's in Santa Barbara. Oh, that's right. You spend lots of time there. That's where I grew up. So yes, mom's in Santa Barbara. Uh, daughter is in Menlo Park. So um, it's it's been it's been nice some nice travel that I've been able to get out and breathe and remind myself what summer in California is like versus Austin, Texas. <laughs> I would all right. There's there's two things. First of all, Santa Barbara for those who watching who don't know anything about it is probably quintessentially a bubble of perfection. I call it bubble of perfection. It's uh -huh. Because you got the breezes, you got the summer. It's summer all the time. It's oh, it's breathtakingly gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Austin, however, I have learned from my friends uh, Susie Spencer and May Cobb and uh, others like that that Austin is a little on the warm side. Occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally, but it's a wet heat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just stand in the garage after you come back from walking to the mailbox and just put a fan on yourself for an hour. But not as bad as Houston. No, Houston is the air. There's no difference between the air and the bayou the, the, as far as the moisture content, I think. So, no offense to my friends from Houston. No. And speaking of Austin, I hear the, the city is blowing up. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 expanding massively and they're they're happy to to gobble up everybody who wants to to turn up from anywhere else in the world so uh i mean constructions is massive um you know traffic follows uh, with that but uh, you know still it's still you know it's, it's a it's a good it's a good city it was a good place for us to land and um when we when we had moved back from england uh, to to the us and you know Fun city, huge outdoor lifestyle, great food scene, great music scene. There's a book scene. Um, Texas Book Festival is here, which is amazing and enormous. You know, every year, forty thousand people uh, attend. You know, over the weekend. So yeah. Note to self: Austin Book Festival. Texas Book Festival. Oh, Texas. Oh, they even closed bigger. downtown. They closed down the main the the main drag downtown, Congress Avenue, and the, they hold half of it. They a lot of it on the state capitol grounds, and it's I see the C-SPAN bookmobile is here, and you know it's uh, it's a big deal. So, so come out. Uh, uh, since I I will be there. By the way, <laughs> so I got to see you at Thriller Fest 2019, and is this. I'm just curious because I want to talk about that. How how does this compare to that? Well, it's it's just a book festival, so it it's it's not the same kind of a festival that we enjoy. No, no, Thriller Fest, which is really a writers' conference, which is uh, sessions with authors, uh, um, you know, several days just about sessions about craft, about you know different aspects of the craft of writing, um, author interviews uh, on 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 a couple of the days, uh, and Thriller Fest really has become more focused on on the business of writing and the craft of writing they've got a master you know master craft classes for that you can sign up for a day with 
with a published author who will, you know, workshop uh, your your stuff. They have a lot of sessions about um, about publishing. They have, you know, pitch sessions with agents. The Texas Book Festival. It's it's invite inviting um, Colson. Whitehead and Tom Hanks and you know famous people to come and have uh, and have thousands of people come listen to them and then and then they've got all the other author panels on different on different topics as well but it's it's open it's free to the public and they like I said they have usually have around forty thousand people uh, over the course of the weekend attend as opposed to Thriller Fest has will have you know several hundred so yeah oh <laughs> that's the size of my hometown. That's crazy. We got tacos for everyone here. <laughs> it's okay. They don't. They don't run out. <laughs> it is its own little. This this whole taco thing has become this whole uh, subculture. Um, I'm starting to see it show up as you know. It used to be five gold stars if you did something good. Now I'm starting to see five gold tacos or hey, this is worthy of a taco or right. if I could get an award, it sure would be a lifetime of tacos what well yeah that? i mean as far as as far as cults go there are worse ones to join <laughs> yeah 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 so back to thriller fest that uh <laughs> we had to take off of course 2020 um 2021 was virtual um i hear from kj how that it's coming back in 22 in early june i want to say mm -hmm. late may early june yeah you're going to be there I am hoping I will be there. Yeah, uh, I have a child who lives in New York City, so there's there's always uh, a reason to attend Thriller Fest. <laughs> what is one of your favorite? And it's probably different from your side of the um, desk than mine, because I, I want to ask you your favorite thing about that. What 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 do you always get inspired by? I mean, for a guy who's coming up <clears throat> as a self publisher, I'm looking for the way the business is run and how to run my business and learn the craft from authors like yourself and so forth. But from your side, besides being, uh, I just want to know what it's like uh, on your side of the table. Oh, uh, as going in as a, as a already published author. I mean, I, I, I'm a joiner. I enjoy conferences. I, I mean, I sit at my desk all year uh, talking to the people in my head. So uh, having a, a conference or a convention um, where I can get out and uh, meet up with like-minded folks as, as a reader, as well as a writer, and just spend several days doing nothing but talking about the topic I love the most right. <laughs> in the world about writing and books, that's, uh, that's like, um, that's just like playtime for me, and I just, I just, I just love going to that. I mean, um, Thriller Fest has uh, again, it's in New York City, so that's always been a huge draw for me. I, I love having a chance to get get to New York, and um, as I've uh, the past few years, I've always I've done just panels at Thriller Fest, which is you know talking about you know like whatever topics like the bad guy or, you know, heroes who wear black hats or, or, or some, you know, they have all kinds of different topics for every, for right. every session. Um, but doing the, the craft fest part of it as well, which is, you know, there's, uh, which means that there's one person who gets up and then lectures essentially on a topic for, for 40, 45 minutes. And I have found that extremely, um, a lot of fun and extremely helpful for my own writing because as always when you teach something you have to um you have to prepare it and you have to make explicit and understandable concepts that may only have been intuitive to you up till then okay my daughter is trying to, to facetime me here so I gotta, <laughs> i'm gonna have to tell her that <laughs> Mommy's busy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. It's okay. That's that's why we edit, and we're back. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you something. You have got. I mean, I'm going to show a little bit of my ignorance, but that's okay for me because there's plenty to go around for everyone. What is? Uh, can you can you tell me the hierarchy of awards that an author can get? Like your Edgar winner multiple times is there I just, I won edgar uh, one I've, I've won one edgar been nominated oh, once, one once okay i've been, I've been just, a judge for the edgars twice and i, I want to give you Ed, edgars for everything i think is what it is 
No, he's just my 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 buddy there on the shelf back there. Oh, nice, nice. Again, I cleaned up the I cleaned up the office and made sure that he that Edgar was uh, prominently displayed instead of a box of Kleenex. And the way that you pointed directly to him, you didn't have that little camera. Oh, do I go this way or that way? I mean, with pure luck, 50 50 yeah. chance. <laughs> That's awesome. So, again, th so there's multiple awards. Is there a, and I, I, I guess I should have spent some time researching the hierarchy of awards, but I mean, how many, what, what's the highest? And is, well, I would is, say, of course, the Edgar, and then maybe Wheel of Fortune, and then the Nobel Prize, but. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in the world of literature, uh, clearly, the, 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 no, the being awarded a Nobel Prize for your body of life's work would be the, the ultimate. But um, yeah. And this, this is, of course, biased by my having won an Edgar and having uh, served as president of the Mystery Writers of America more recently, that I, I think the Edgar is, um, is the most prestigious uh, uh, Awarded crime writing. It's it's juried award. I mean, they have a panel of, of professional of, of professional authors who are who, who judge it. The um, the the Dagger Awards in Britain um, from the, the the Crime Writers Association. Those are also extremely um, extremely prestigious. Um, there are a lot of of, of, of well established uh, awards. Uh, the the Anthony Awards, the the Berries, um, the the International Thriller Award is is much more recent. I mean that's that's been started since Thriller Fest was um, was inaugurated. Now what 15, 10, 15 years ago? So, um, but it's it's always wonderful to, to 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 get recognition from your peers. There's 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 nothing wrong with that. It's 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 really validating. It's lovely. Um, it's something that can be put on the you know the, the cover of your novel uh, from now till till the end of time. And um, New York Times bestselling author. That's that certainly is up there. You got to edit that. What? I'm not yet a New York Times bestselling author. No, no, no. I'm saying a New York Times bestselling author would be. It's kind of like the thing I always think to myself. If I could aspire to that, if I could make that, I, I feel like to me that's always been because it says to me that it's chosen by your fans, the the, the audience, readers. I, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine that. It's pretty amazing well yeah i mean it's i mean it's extremely competitive it has a huge cachet that's a very small list that comes out every week so it's it's extremely tough to to crack um it doesn't even necessarily mean that you sold the most books in the country that week by by any by any measure <laughs> new york times does not just tabulate the total number of books sold um in in the united states in a week and then and then list them on its on its site Oh, okay. Because tabulating how many books are sold is an extremely difficult uh, task. Not every, um, not every bookseller. You would have to have a, a database that 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 submits. There are there are um, a number of bookstore independent bookstores in the United States that the, the New York Times relies on to send them their sales data every week. Um, they they also rely mysteriously on some algorithm and and book scan and uh, Ingram and all kinds of other things. But uh, there there is no master database of books sold in the United States every week. And there are plenty of people who um, who sell huge amounts of of uh, you know uh, numbers of books and and may never uh, may never make the the New York Times bestseller list and. Uh, for instance, if uh, I don't know that self-published authors are, are recognized on on the list at all, so and they're, they're I mean that, and that's that's a really tough nut to, to crack at a, at a huge level. I mean I, I I know people who are extremely good at independently publishing and they you know they're very successful, but um, that the kind of recognition that you would get from having you know the the gray lady put its uh, you know put its stamp on it is uh, might be elusive in that situation. Yeah. You know, I think I got, I'm trying to remember how I got turned on to you. I think I remember seeing China Lake. Um, I was doing, this is so odd. I was doing an analysis in my head uh, for some book covers and I ran, I was researching because self-published often will do your own book covers. <clears throat> and I remember seeing China Lake and I'm like, 
oh my God, that kind of says exactly what I want. And then I started reading about you and it was probably shortly thereafter. And I, I'd love to, I'd love to impress you by saying, and I've read all of your books, but I did, I picked up Unsub and I was like, holy crap, this is great. And then I went right into, into the black nowhere. And then of course I saw you and I picked up the dark corners of the night and I, uh, that's, it's so funny. It's like picking a favorite book is like picking your favorite child because often the book that gets me introduced to someone uh, has a visceral connection that I go, oh my God, that's the book, your character, the way, and, and God, Meg, I use you as an example. I, I don't know if my audience has gotten bored of it yet, but I use you as an example in about every single friggin' conversation. Matter of fact, on a recent edition with um, Sharon Doring, I went all just, I was all Meg love forever because- I'm not gonna stop you. <laughs> yeah. No, you have this ability to turn a phrase and to, first of all, uh, I'm I'm humbled by your vast uh, vocabulary, and I and I've I've often said to my wife, "Do you think she sleeps with a thesaurus? Because her words are just pointing, pointing." Let's see, it's what right there. Uh, I think it's right there. The thesaurus, okay. the big fat one. <laughs> but joke, all joking aside, you have just the most beautiful way with description and words well I, mean, I, I appreciate you the fact that you think so no 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 i you there's a couple of guys a couple of people that i think of well raymond chandler back in the day i loved his terse uh dialogue just the way it was always jimpity pam and then i grew into really love elmore leonard because of the way he just trimmed every square inch of fat off of any sentence and i'm like mm -hmm. When you read Elmore Leonard at length, then you realize, man, I am just a babbling fool. <laughs> but then I discovered Pat Conroy, and this is coming back to you. So Pat Conroy in a paragraph would paint this languorous, luscious, lovely alliteration, another L, um, mm -hmm. scene that could say so much with so few words, although he used plenty of words, um, that would just make your mind expand. And every time I read your stuff, I think of that. And it's oh, the best compliment. You. I mean, that's, I that's also the, the, um, the brilliance of editing, <laughs> that, that, that having a chance to do a second, a third, a fourth, however many drafts, that you you hope that you will improve the prose with every with every draft, uh, and it took me a long time to learn that being able to turn a phrase or or come up with a quip in dialogue was wonderful. It was fun. It you know it made me feel sparkly. It's not enough. Uh, that doesn't make a book. So of course, uh, if 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 a turn of phrase comes to a writer go with it. The inspiration is is always wonderful. If a, if a fantastic uh, uh, interchange in dialogue pops into your head, write it down. Uh, don't ever just rest on that, though, because none of it's going to matter unless you have, you know, absolutely powerful characters who are in a really dynamic conflict in a, in a story with a big hook that, you know, builds to a gripping conclusion. So, that's what that's what polishing is for. When you come to the la you know, when you come to the end, you can, you know, you 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 find that dialogue that's just kind of sitting there like a wet washcloth, and you, and you slap it into shape. <laughs> I'm trying to think of uh, like, uh, you know, the the reason we love mysteries and thrillers is because it makes us try to figure it out, and we the, the we turn the page to to take that speed and run with it and escape and love every minute of it. And I've, I'm trying to think of if it was Into the Black Nowhere or Dark Corners of the Night. At the end, when I thought it was like, dun, 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 dun. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, there's more. Dun, 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 dun. OK, well, they can't go anymore. Dun, 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 dun. Oh. <laughs> OK. Well, you know, I will, I will tell you two, two, two sources that taught me how to do stuff like that. One is, okay. is Jeffrey Deaver. 
who uh, you know who um, is the master of misdirection and the master of the, the the twist followed by the twist followed by the twist and he spends a lot of time uh, before he sits down to actually draft a book he spends a lot of he spends months uh, thinking up uh, the book and those twists and the the second is uh, Tex Avery and um, and uh, and Chuck, who's who's the uh, the Looney Tunes director Chuck Jones that you don't just have a uh, uh, a punchline, then you have a twist into a second punchline, and then a third twist into the third into the third punchline. So watch watch every Roadrunner cartoon, <laughs> and see how it how it never just how it never just it just rests on a, on a single joke. It's there's always a couple of more coming. So those were. Those you are, are so yeah. right. I'm sitting here going back. It's like, it, it's not just the cliff, but it's the cliff and then it drops and then there's a twig and then, oh, you fall. And then, oh, wait, there's one dangling leaf. Yeah. And then the piano lands on him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or the massive anvil. Uh -huh. Je Jeffrey Deaver, uh, I've tried to, I think the very first book I read of his may have been when he had, I want to say it, maybe he had taken on the James Bond franchise. Mm -hmm. Carte Blanche. Yes, and I was like, wow, this mofo can write. Mm -hmm. And you're right, I never thought about that, but I'm gonna go back and reread that because I want to, that really is a, a, a craft, a talent to up, yeah. up, up, up. Yeah, and it's all, you've all gotta, you've gotta build it in there, you've gotta build it in. Uh, when you think it up, you've got to go back and 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 try to figure out how this fits with character. Does it? Is it? Will it actually advance the plot? Will it surprise and delight the readers without making them think, "Oh, that this is just stupid and 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 ridiculous"? It's all got to fit. Yeah, it's sometimes I say to myself, uh, the people who, uh, what did I read? Okay, I don't want to mention that because I loved the book, but there was this one element that they did. And it was, they were running to this and then they had a car chase and they were run to this and then it was a motorcycle and this. And there was a point, I, my wife and I, were, I handed it to her, she read it right away and she said, uh, I, I got it, there's a chase going on. <laughs> you know, it's just so funny because she reads differently than I do. She's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, so there's a chase, got it, move on. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Um, so China Lake, Mission Canyon, Jericho Point, Crosscut, Kill Chain, that's, mm -hmm. Evan Delaney, um, Joe Beckett, Dirty Secrets Club, uh, The Memory Club, Liar's Lullaby, uh, The Nightmare Thief. And when you finished, when those series came to you, you, you said to yourself, hey, you know what, this feels like two or three, maybe four books. Do you see it that way? Do you go, yeah, no? Not at all. I mean, I just, I wrote China Lake. I wrote China Lake. I had an idea for the character and the and the and the story, and so I wrote China Lake, <laughs> and uh, then I was offered a, a publishing contract uh, in the UK with Hotter and Stoughton, and they said um, we'd like you to write another book. Can you write a sequel? And I said, of course I can. And then I panicked because I had no idea what I was going to write about because I had only thought about China Lake, uh, so I did not conceive of it as a as a series. Uh, but they asked me if I could turn it into one. So I, um, so I did, uh, but of course, after, after there are five books, I will, I will say to anybody, who, anybody who was out there, cause I get this question still a lot is that, will I, will I ever continue the series? And I do have the sixth book, uh, kind of, kind of outlined. I don't have a space for it on the publication schedule yet. Um, because the, the fifth book kind of ends on a, on a cliffhanger and now it's been years. So people are kind of wondering. Is, are, is, are they still holding on to that clip or is that, you know, like, are the roots starting to tear out? Are they going to fall off or what? Right, right. Uh, but the um, thing was with that series, because I just wrote the, uh, the book that just came to me and it was a, you know, a passion project, it, I didn't consciously try to craft it as a crime series. Uh, I, Evan Delaney is a, a journalist. She, she's a writer. She's an, and a, and a, former lawyer. So she is not in the crime business, you know, and the, the China Lake was about, um, was about her family. And, uh, you know, she's trying to protect her nephew from, um, 
this apocalyptic sect that his that his mother has joined uh, while his dad is uh, is uh, he's a naval aviator and he's deployed uh, you know at sea. So Evan is taking care of this little boy, the six year old boy, and the mother comes back and wants him, and she's going to take him off to this you know this cult compound and Evan has to try to keep them from getting getting hold of him. Uh, so that was that was the the thread of this of the story. I didn't correct consciously craft it as well Evan is going to be a crime fighter she's going to you know she's going to have uh, adventures like Kinsey Milhone or, or V.I. Warshawski oh, yeah. or, or anything like that so um, to, to create a series then with a, with a character who uh, is uh, is not in law enforcement is not a PI um, doesn't really uh, doesn't really have uh, a, a career as an investigator other than being other than being an investigative journalist. So uh, how how was I going to continue that series indefinitely? Uh, became became a question. That's, I ended it on a, on a cliffhanger, <laughs> but, and by that nice. point, I'd had um, my I'd had a concept for uh, the Dirty Secrets Club, which was not a story that fit with anything that Evan Delaney would be involved in. So if, if you're going to write a story, you've got to write, write the story, but it's, it needs to center on the character who has the most at stake in that story and who, who fits with that story. So I created um, a, an entirely different world for, uh, for, for that book centered around, um, centered Joe, on, Beckett. Uh, Joe Beckett, who's a forensic psychiatrist who consults for the San Francisco police. So, yeah. So you're you're not going on record as saying that the sixth will drop in the Delaney. No, it's not going to yeah. drop. Evan Evan does appear in in the Nightmare Thief. That's a crossover. It's got her and Joe both in that. And uh, I the there's a Evan Delaney prequel short story in a in a in an anthology of short stories that was uh, published last year. Deadly anthology, Deadly Anniversaries, which is just out in paperback uh, this year. So. Um, but uh, for, for people who are gonna email me or, or tweet at me, don't, I have not forgotten about these people. I still like them, I still like them. They're, they're, they're just sitting in the back room kind of twiddling their thumbs and looking at their watches, wondering what, what's up with me. And so with Joe Beckett, for instance, um, when you got to the end of that, those four books, or uh, that's when you go, you know what, en enough was said, or was it like the first story where Hey, do you have any more of this? I mean, that's got to be a, a, an amazing happenstance for someone to just say, "I love that, and let's make it more." As long yeah, as you're feeling, it's, it's wonderful. And you know, part part of it is is what uh, is uh, the the stories that come to me. Part of it, of course, is uh, the business of publishing, where um, if if publishers are really hot for standalone novels, sometimes you know they will say, "Okay." Uh, everybody wants standalone novels now. Uh, what have you got? Do you have an idea for that? You know, for a self-contained book. So, uh, like I say, I certainly do, and I've uh, published three standalones, uh, uh, as well as uh, now three series. So uh, it's 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 mix and match. I mean, some stories uh, really do come to a conclusion uh, for for the characters in their world, and uh, they could. But readers love them just as much as uh, as a series. That's a great question. Does does that move in cycles? Is there a point where you're like, oh, everybody wants a series, and then all of a sudden, no, nah, let's just do standalones? Because I'm thinking of uh, a lot of the authors that I follow, they do a lot of standalones. So, uh, what what's your take on that and or experience? It's um, readers love series. The, the issue with series sometimes is that readers always want to start at the beginning. So if you uh, have book 16 in a series coming out and they've never heard of you, they might say, uh, I would love to start a new series, but I'm not going to read this one. I got I'm going to go back to, to number one and start there. Um, I, I had a, I got an email from a reader who was uh, recently who was very disappointed that he picked up uh, one of the Evan Delaney novels and that it did not say part five on the cover. <laughs> So there's all kinds of stuff in here that 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 I don't know about. Boo hoo! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I presume that this all happened in the previous four books. <laughs> oh, well, but, yeah. That's why that's why all the books are listed in order and at the inside the front cover. Yeah. Hmm. And, 
Oh, that's what that table of contents yeah, is anyway, for. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of readers will take a, will, as the Brits say, take a flyer on um, on a standalone, and um, and and that's how a lot of books become, you know, the the big, you know, the big talking points of the summer. It's easy to pick up a, a a fresh book that's got a fresh idea, and you know, readers will glom onto that joyfully so uh, and there's nothing ab absolutely nothing wrong with that but a lot of the a lot of the big books of the past few years have been have been have been standalone novels think of gone girl um the chain uh you know the girl on the train uh, uh falling this summer um the razor blade tears that's you know those are those are all uh, those are all standalones so uh, Going There's ahead. so many things rushing through my head uh, at a at a whizzing pass. Uh, I'm going to go in reverse order. Razor blade tears. Did I did I see a? That's tweet just out. That is just out. Last uh, a few days ago, uh, last week. Uh, S. A. Cosby. It's a southern rural noir. Yeah, and your husband said uh, he's going on a flight. He goes, I'm not leaving without that book or something. Did right, I right. Because he had read, he had read uh, the 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 John Cosby's previous novel um, uh, a few months ago, and he loved it so much that a uh, blacktop wasteland, he loved that book so much that he said, okay, uh, I hear this dude has a new book out. Is that true? I said, yes. He goes, okay, now I know what I want to read. So. Wow. Yeah. All right. Question number two. So he's an avid reader. Yes. Your husband. Yeah. My husband. Yes. And he's read everything you've written. Damn right. Damn straight girl. And if you don't, you're not coming home. That's right. And uh, you mentioned another one, T.J. Newman with Falling. Have you, yes. have you seen anything like that happen quite that big and that fast and that? Well, sure, it happens. I mean, it happened with uh, with Dan Brown, with um, you know, with Angels and Demons and uh, right. Debussy, but, yeah. but it's but it's a it's a it's a fantastic book. It's a it's a great summer thriller. Absolutely yeah. fantastic and. Uh, you know, she's got the she's got the cred. I mean, it's about like a it's about an airline pilot who boards his flight, cross country flight, and uh, as he takes off, he gets a message that says, "We have your family, crash the plane or they die." Uh, so what's he gonna do? Um, and uh, and the author is uh, is a um, spent you know ten years as a flight attendant for Virgin America and Alaska Airlines. So um, so that gives you like, oh, she's got the inside scoop. She knows what yeah. she's. Out. so it's uh but it's it's a it is a rocket sled of a book um so i totally recommend it yeah i think i read it it, it took me it took me only two days maybe yeah. maybe two and a half days wife read it she read it in uh a day and a half it was we we just ripped through it mm -hmm. um i'm trying to think of the last book that well i gotta tell you um unsub i ripped through because that was such a poignant powerful character and you, this this other thing flashed in my head uh, uh, when you were speaking, and uh, I'm, I wanted to make sure I I thanked you again, like I don't like I don't do this enough. Thriller Fest 2019. I think I had just I came up. I got you to sign one of my books, and we're chatting. I don't know if you remember this. I, I do remember. It was in one of those big rooms where they where you have to hop down off the stage to to talk to people. Yeah. Yeah, but I had just I gotten a little deflated because I just pitched a book that I took up there with me, and and uh, the gentleman uh, just just couldn't have been any more no no no, and I was <laughs> like wow, and I was okay, and we talked about it. I've taught I've told this story too many times on the show, so I'm not going to tell it again. But I walked in and I was coming in. A, you were one of the first faces I saw, and I I generally don't try to wear that laundry in public, but. Uh, you were just, you're so approachable and so kind. And I made the comment about, man, he just shot that story down. And you said, so? And I'm like, yeah, so that's one opinion. And and secondly, it's your story. I was talking about it. It, it had already been done before. Yeah, but no one's going to tell like you, David. Mm -hmm. I walked away, Meg. I would, you'll, you'll never really know what that meant to me. It just, it meant the well, world. I'm glad, and I I would stand by that today. Yeah. It's absolutely true. It is. It's hard to hear. It, there's, I mean, there's nothing. It's hard to get a rejection on paper. It's 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 hard to get it in the in an envelope or in your inbox. Uh, it's it's 
it's awful to, to get it face to face. Uh, but um, and it, when we keep saying, you know, we got to develop a, a thick skin, you know, well, yeah, well, we don't want to, you know, like develop, you know, a paper cut just looking at a piece of paper. But but you don't want to be a, a rhinoceros about this stuff. It's it's it, this is the work of you know, <laughs> God knows how many years and how much sweat and and labor and love that you put into it. So it's, of course it's going to sting, and it the. Uh, there's no way it's that it shouldn't, but yeah. but so what? So what? <laughs> so what? <laughs> Two words. You sent me on my way. I I, awesome. I walked on clouds from there. I, I think it was just because I respect you so much, and I thought she, yeah, she's right. And and I'm I'm not lacking for confidence. I don't <laughs> don't don't worry about that. I didn't get to where I got by being a, a unconfident, but you know, this is a new career. This is my third chapter, my third career. So uh, I'm going in at kind of two, two guns loaded and full barrels. And, yeah, and, and, and I, and I, I probably said that to you because I, I, I think I trusted you enough that, that, that you were, that you were smart enough and understand the business enough to know that, um, yeah, sometimes what we've, what we write won't sell. Uh, and what that means is that we need to look at what at what we've written and find out number one is it strong enough is there a reason why it didn't you know if if every comment and critique we get you know hits on the same thing like no uh calling it jurassic park about <laughs> these scientists reanimated the dinosaurs really has been done yeah. um, <laughs> that we might listen to that but but being willing to um, to continue to work on our craft and to go on to and to be willing always be ready to write the next thing that um, if if for some reason our stuff isn't hitting we we've got the we've got more stuff yeah well and and to put a pin in that or a button on it is um i did learn a lot that was that was two years ago now and i i learned enough that said you know you're right is it the best thing? It's pretty good. Uh, I went back and worked on it harder again and recrafted some things. Um, but I'm also a big fan of finish it, move on. There's plenty more. I mean, mm -hmm. as you and I both know, uh, you probably do this all the time. Well, of course you do. And we're going to get to crime headlines in a second. Um, there's all you got to do is pick up a newspaper or uh, hear something on the radio and uh, it'll just trigger a thought and you're like huh what if this were to turn that upside down so mm -hmm. point taken um tony and um uh, moving on but yet i digress mm -hmm. uh i did want to did we unsub black nowhere dark corners is is there a fourth yes sub four is is coming details very soon so okay Yes. And I do know, I remember I was piddling across, Blackstone Publishing has become some mm -hmm. kind of a behemoth. I mean, it's only the largest indie publisher of audiobooks, maybe, I don't know, in the business. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that they were doing a little um, co-op, uh, cooperative venture with the, the Story Factory, who uh, helps manage you and your intellectual property. What, whatever... And, and gosh, if this is already, if I missed it, then somebody just shoot me in the face. Um, I know Amazon bought Dark Corners of the Night. That is still yet to come, correct? Correct. Amazon Studios bought uh, the Dark Corners of the Night for development as a television drama. Yes. So, um, so that is in process right now. But, which means, you know, they've got a uh, Lawrence Trilling is uh, executive producing it. He's the showrunner. He also um, uh, makes uh, Goliath with Billy Bob Thornton for Amazon. So um, the the, the, the pilot is uh, is being written um, and they've got, you know, they've got a team assembled for all of that. And I hope there will be more news soon, but it's all, it's, I've got a lot of stuff that's like, the stuff is, is, is bubbling, but uh, I'm, I'm being coy about, about exactly what's going on. So that's fine. But you, you, uh, I, I, I just want to tap into your enthusiasm. I don't, I don't need uh, secret details. I, that wouldn't be fair, but that's got to be one of the, I mean, that's my ultimate dream. I mean, I can't think of a more ultimate dream than to write a book and yay, and then get it turned on to the screen because that's one of my side hobbies. But what does that <laughs> feel like for you? 
Oh, it's it's wonderful. It's I'm aware that it's that it's a uh, I I've I've tried deliberately to treat it as the cherry on the Sunday. That I mean, there's so many more books written every year than um, the than television shows or movies ever produced. So it's 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 a it's an uphill climb anyway to uh, to get attention to 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 a novel and have it have it optioned for for the screen. So I was absolutely 100 percent delighted by that extremely excited to know that uh you know who what who was that the production company and the people behind it uh are you know extremely professional and wonderful storytellers and to have some uh the trust that they will do right by by the material and like you said it's a, it's a completely different medium it's a different me method of storytelling so i i'm involved but i'm not i'm not at, around the table writing you know uh writing dialogue day by day with the with the the, with with the primary screenwriter, so um, I, as an author, you have to be willing to let go a bit to know that it need, it will have to be reimagined for for the screen. And if if you can't if you can't do that, then you'd other, better be in a position where you you get to to create it yourself and and put it out there. Otherwise, uh, don't bother you know don't bother sending it out if if you're going to be a stickler for uh, making sure it's exactly the way it is on the page. But you would like to, I'm assuming, I, I have to believe because you're so hyper creative, you would love to get inside that writer's room, maybe eventually and, oh, and sure, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, fairly recently discovered, uh, you know, final draft software, and that formats everything for you. It's so much more intuitive than Word. I'm like, this is a piece of cake. No, no offense to screenwriters. I know how exacting and tough the discipline in the industry is but so that was that was a formatting joke yeah i've written two screenplays and one of them fortunately was able to get turned into a movie by my hand thankfully um and uh the format is specific and i thought i knew the format until i showed i've got a buddy a long long time buddy who works at the Warner Brothers, and he looked at one of my first screenplays, and he he goes, "Okay, here's the good news. You know you know how to use Final Draft. Here's the bad news. You're about forty five pages over, and you're giving me way too much direction. And here's why. And he's like, mm -hmm. ch -ch 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 -ch. and that's a harsh but really powerful lesson because it's a whole different way to tell a story. But I got to tell you something." I love writing screenplays because, which is, it's going to sound counterintuitive because like with your writing and the writing we all love is color and depth and fragrance, and tremors and scares and oh my's and stacks, whereas screenplay is Meg David sat in a room. She looked at him. What are you going to do? Drink that or what? You know, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then you allow the rest of the team to develop it from there. But yeah, it's yeah, yeah. so much. So you just got, you picked up a copy. Uh, oh, a, a, a final, final draft. draft. Yeah. yeah. And you're, you're digging that. Have you tried to take one of your stories or just an idea of a story and put it in there just for kicks and giggles? Oh, I, ha I have written, you know, tr just tried to do it. Uh, you know, and, and even beyond like the, the dinosaur attack, the Taco Bell kind of, you know, level of this is how you this is how you do the the, the exposition and the and the and the dialogue. But uh, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see where that goes eventually. But uh, right now I'm 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 stuck into uh, into writing novels uh, and, and hoping to branch out a bit more and flex some more muscles. Now, so TV and film being two different things, have you had anybody approach you? Um, would you like to do take one of your books and turn it into a movie? Two I wouldn't point. say no. Again, yeah. <laughs> I'm the only author I know who is who absolutely refused to let her material be adapted with Sue Grafton. Uh, she would not let the the Alphabet Mysteries be adapted. She had been a television writer, and she said she knew too much about how the sausage was made, and she didn't uh, want to turn her characters over to anybody. So, okay, two things I never knew that she was uh, in the business at that one time, and that she, yeah, I love that series. I read every single stinking one of them until the end. Um, God, she had such a beautiful, simple, elegant way to tell a story. Oh, uh, but yeah, but she, I mean, 
<laughs> if, so, if someone, uh, you know, if the MGM helicopter settled on my lawn outside, which I presume they've got helicopters for these things, that, and, uh, and said, hey, we want this book, I would be abandoning you and running outside. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Landed on the on the south lawn, would you? Uh, that front lawn is just so, you know, we <laughs> just planted the seeds and um, who uh, this is one of my guilty pleasures of the day is following your crime headlines. <laughs> oh, on and, Twitter, yes. oh my God, on Twitter. And they're just you. I and I, I try not to comment on too many of them because people have better uh, things to do with their time than see what I go. Really? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Again? Why? How are you? But here's my point. First of all, I want to know the gestation of that because I, I I love I want to hear how your crazy kooky little mind goes. And number two, so you can ponder on this, is give me one that you run across lately, lately that you said to yourself, okay, now this one takes it to a whole new level. Oof, I'd have to go back. There's there are just so many. It's hard to sort yeah. through them. I um, life is pretty absurd, and um, there are uh, thanks to uh, television cameras and cell phone cameras and uh, news feeds. There are plenty of ways to find out just how absurd uh, Homo sapiens can actually behave. So. Uh, I, Twitter can become a, you know, it can become a doom scrolling cesspool of negativity and snark. And I thought I would rather inject some, some levity into that. And being a crime writer, I would just look for dumb crimes. Not everything is a crime headline of the day. Sometimes it's just a, a headline of the day. The, mo the one that got the, the biggest response and the, this year was uh, was the BBC headline, um, Mystery Beast in Tree Revealed as Croissant. <laughs> like they'd had like a SWAT team and animal control come out to, to, to like, to like taser this like beast, this strange beast in a tree outside an apartment building and it was a croissant, so. <laughs> But the, the but the crime headline of the day is is people people can be dumb and uh, so just pointing out the absolutely uh, absurd ways they uh, do dumbness in public and get caught for it um, I use it as a lesson and as a way to just absolutely point and laugh at at, at people I try I try to make sure that I do not I do not generally ever post anything about something where people get seriously hurt. Right, right, right. Uh, there's, we're not, I don't, the, the crime headline of the day is not about a series of gruesome murders or, you know, or, or certainly about animals being injured or, or anything like that, but just, you know, it's like uh, a drunken pig attacks cow and cop that comes to, that, come, that, that, that arrives to stop the melee uh, or, you know, oh. <laughs> Woman crashes through through ceiling tiles at uh, at Burger King in attempt to steal the fries. That that kind of that kind of thing. <laughs> so, and, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes I put the states. Uh, you know, if it happens in a particular state, I put that in the in the um, in the tweet, which is basically to tell the rest of the United States you you're not trying hard enough to keep up with Florida, so you better up your game. <laughs> so. <laughs> And no offense to certain shopping complexes, but why do I see more of the stranger stories happening in or near a Walmart? <laughs> a lot of square footage. They've got, they're, they're big. <laughs> a lot of square footage on the floor. Nicely there. done. Nicely done. I don't but know why. Know, there do tend to be themes, and you find out that certain phrasing of, of headlines tends to be funnier. And um, I realize you, you don't comment that often, but uh, Sandra Brown, the, the author, every, every now and then she she comments and she goes, naked again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks like, you know, it's like... <laughs> Uh, someone uh, captured with uh, with uh, you know 175 bowling balls uh, stolen from the alley, naked. And she's like, "Why are they always naked? Why are they always naked?" Because it's funnier if I find a find a headline where someone is doing something stupid, um, literally exposing themselves to ridicule. <laughs> yeah, you you wonder what's going through their mind. Okay, I could just go steal these, but I'll go naked. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm trying to think of the last crazy thing I did naked, but uh, maybe I'll save that for another show. Um, yeah. So last night over dinner, um, my wife and I were talking, and I, I know this question coming at you is probably got to be in the top three questions you get asked. Uh, so you can you can go, Dave, please shut up. I've heard that too much. Or you can go, oh, here you go. And I said, hey, uh, because being in radio, I, I'd like to hear different opinions. Honey, if you could ask Meg Gardner any one thing, what would it be? She goes, you know what? Because she loved Dark Corners of the Night. Mm -hmm. She read that probably the second fastest I've seen her read anything. And she said, uh, I just want to know. She goes, you talk so highly of her. And, and I've seen her her posts and different she seems so sweet where does she come up with these up ideas and I said well I'll ask her yes I am sweet <laughs> that doesn't mean that I can't come up with crazy ideas you know the editor says or an agent says could could you write a, a, a really terrifying novel about a serial killer I say yes I could give me give me a chance to think about everything that uh that terrifies me and that seems to be terrifying everyone uh, in in the in the culture and is ringing a bell with people's uh, conscious and unconscious uh, fears and I'll see how I can um, can pull that out and turn that into uh, some gripping fiction send you guys on a roller coaster ride yeah. uh, um, in an emotionally satisfying way I mean we all like uh, to take a look at the dark side of things and and one thing that thrillers do is allow us as writers to take readers on that journey but make let them feel like we're going to bring them back safely oh, that's good we're, way not, we're not going to just have the the roller coaster end um, uh, or like the the, the the Simpsons the the, the escalator to nowhere where people get up and ah, they keep going right. up. Uh, that that we are going to bring the bring it back around uh, to the you know to the platform and let you uh, get off safely perhaps with your hair a little a little must but uh, in one piece so uh, yeah I mean we all have uh, as Stephen King says you want to write a story uh, go down into the basement dig up the stuff that's down there and uh, we we just have to be willing to to access it doesn't mean that I wasn't good at making cupcakes for the you know the second grade classroom. I wasn't a den mother for the Cub Scouts. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Honey, she's not really that evil. She's, <laughs> she's still very sweet. She just got a demented mind. But let's keep yeah. that between us. Um, it all comes out on the page, not, out, not, in, not in my actions on, uh, on the street. So that's, that's good. Well, you know, when I, I I I think of it this way, <clears throat> when's the last time you got really really mad at someone or or, or a situation, not pointing anyone specifically, and you go, man, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to, and I so I have those thoughts quite often, and uh, so I'm talking to Tammy the other day, and I, I got I was in a mood, and she goes, well, what would you say to him? I'm like, say to him, no, I want to take some garden shears and take his fingers off one by one at the middle knuckle until one hand is done and go now now how you feeling <laughs> and she looks at me like okay wow so Point you guys being. are pretty open about about your feelings <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so you could you could say that i i'm very transparent meg i'll mm -hmm. tell you like it is but you know um we watch an inordinate amount of detective shows and I'm completely sucked into PBS. I don't know why. I, PBS has a whole different mindset about their detective stories. We're, stories. we're watching uh, Un, Unforgotten right now and I can't get enough of them. And every, you know, night after night, I, we, we watch two or three episodes at a time and I'm like, and the other night I said, what is it about me that I just love to watch all this dark humanity? It doesn't really affect me. And I, I kind of ask you that, what do you think that thing is in us that we just like to peek behind that and? Well, we're, we're nosy, <laughs> we're, we're curious and we're nosy and uh, we love gossip. We love, uh, uh, like you said, a peek behind the curtain. We like to see uh, how uh, any, any uh, arcane, uh, 
closed off world actually operates, whether it's uh, the FBI, uh, you know, or Treadstone uh, in the born, you know, the the, right. the the born books and movies, or the mafia, uh, or um, uh, in, in anti-hero stories, you know, uh, the the meth lab that uh, that Walter White uh, uh, runs in Breaking Bad, and um, we sometimes we watch to see see the bad guys get their comeuppance. We like to, to look to see how far they're going and wonder how we would behave in the same situation, hoping that we would uh, act differently. And I think we also really, um, in the US, Britain, especially uh, the fiction that, that's been written for 90 years, um, or even going back to, uh, you know, back to the 19th century, uh, the whole concept of mystery and detective stories implies that we recognize that there are uh, things can go wrong in the world, that there are injustices, that crimes are committed, and that that's not a good thing. But there are forces attempting to put it right. That when chaos uh, causes uh, someone's world to uh, to fall apart, or you know them to be uh, victimized in a crime, that that society will recognize that, and that there are people who will act on all our behalves to try to. Uh, uh, to bring about some form of justice. And they, the, these stories imply that justice is a thing that exists, that we don't just live in this, you know, nasty, brutish and short uh, state of nature world where, you know, that anything goes, that, that, that there are rights and wrongs and that we can distinguish between them and that um, Occasionally, uh, we can we can put right what is wrong at least at least in some way. So they are uh, they can be very dark, but they can be essentially hopeful and optimistic. And uh, overall, I think. Yeah, that is one of the most concise, well thought out answers I I may have heard in quite some time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, bravo. <laughs> and which begs a question as I'm listening. And, and I'm, it's a little bit of putting you on the spot, but maybe not. Well, the first question is, what do you read in your spare time? And the second question is, do you have a favorite author? That's the one that kind of puts you on the spot. But I, um, I read very eclectically. Uh, I, treat, I read very widely in the thriller and crime genre. Uh, the reason I write these books, I think, is because I grew up uh, and came to adulthood loving thrillers, just absolutely loving them, inhaling them. The you know the, the tension, the suspense, the race against time, the, the, the gigantic stakes, the people who have to make life and death decisions with their backs up against the wall, finding who can rise to the challenge. You know who's going to who's going to fall, who's going to betray, who's going to you know where will courage win out? I mean that just that just swept me away. But um, as far as uh, I read. Uh, I read a lot of nonfiction as well. Uh, I'm trying to uh, make, I mean, I've, I read voraciously. So a lot of my favorite authors, I've already read everything they've, they've written, which means that I get a chance. I'm trying to deliberately make sure I, I, I reach out and, and read authors who are new to me to see what, you know, what, what other voices who I haven't heard are really, are really talking about. Everybody from S.A. Cosby, um, Rachel Housel Hall, Alifair Burke, um, Stephen Graham Jones, who isn't quite crime, he he, he 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 writes some some horror, just to really find fresh new stories and 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 love the writing and and everything. Favorite authors? I mean, you, I would go on until my computer like blew up here. And just give me two or three hundred, uh, you know. No, no, no I, just I will, I will just give you Stephen King. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. For for reasons uh, uh, cultural uh, and, and personal, he's just always going to be my favorite author. He, his, I mean, his books just consistently have blown me away since I ever picked up since I first picked up the stand. Um, and uh, since then, he again, he's another he's 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 the biggest dog in American lit, I think. And he has been very kind to me and to so many other writers it's uh, paying it forward because uh because people listen to him that it's um it's been ex extremely gratifying he does have a way with words and his volume his repeated volume 
uh, this last little venture, side venture notwithstanding, which is a smaller paperback, and I, I can't, it, it's not ringing me right. It was hard case time. I can't, the, t the title eludes me, but yeah, he's written for them before. Um, yeah, it looks like a, a Pulp Fiction uh, brag. And, but boy, I, I just, I, I am boggled at the volume of words. And it's not just like, I remember Thomas Wolfe used to, he, he had voluminous novels. Uh, he, he could spend chapters just walking into a room before he got to the other end of the room describing it. And that's that's not Stephen. Stephen is just always, it's just a slow, steady, steep, uh, lingering staircase to uh, frantic surprise. And he understands character and the people he writes about feel extremely real to us on the, on the, on the page. He understands, uh, um, American characters from from the trailer park to the White House. So uh, he's seriously he 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 knows he knows people from the inside out, and he portrays them with with uh, insight and compassion. Even the worst people, they they remain human beings, uh, and uh, and which makes them which makes the stories feel no matter how out there they are uh, with supernatural elements, they feel. Um, grounded in in emotional reality, so uh, he's 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 our he's our Dickens in that way. <laughs> His stuff is going to last. You know, everybody uh, or most everyone knows who knows you knows you're a prolific writer. You have a way with words. You're very well spoken. You're a Jeopardy genius. Um, well, what is something that someone doesn't know would be surprised to learn let's put it that way because if i said what they don't know the minute you said it oh now everyone knows but what would what would be something that people would be surprised to learn about meg gardner i um i lettered in cross country in college in, in uh, at, at stanford yeah i was on the cross country team let's see what else and uh, this, 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 not everybody knows this, even though it is in my Twitter bio. I'm a reformed mime. I'm a re re rehabilitated mime. <laughs> I was a theater kid in high school. I joined the mime troupe because I couldn't sing. <laughs> oh my God, that is so funny. I could it was go fun. On. It was huge fun. <laughs> but I will warn anybody if, if you, if you, uh, go out to a performance wearing white pancake makeup and, and black turtlenecks. It, it's just say, if you stop at the Baskin Robbins on the way back to sixth period, don't be surprised if the next thing you see are the, are the sheriff's, uh, you know, are the, are the splashing lights in your rear view mirror because someone has called, called, the, called 911 and said that um, the Baskin Robbins was being robbed. <laughs> Oh God, that's my, I'm just trying to see you doing some mime. I'm, I'm going to see, maybe we can, maybe we can bring some of that back in uh, Thriller Fest uh, 2022. Uh, well, you, that I would, um, I could carve out a little space. I could carve out a box. Yeah, and nice. Wrap myself in it, in a corner of the room. Just like you've got that one behind you. You've got your yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> my box would have, would, I would eventually be easier to get out of because I wouldn't yeah. have to actually get a get a screwdriver to disassemble it <laughs> so as we wrap it down and you've been so gracious with your time thank you very much meg um i i'd like to ask a few questions that i'm just it's just pure curiosity part of it is voyeur part of it's just you know my radio background so i'm like when you sit down to write do you like to listen to music or do you like it silent and if you do like music what's do you have a certain flavor that you like to listen to genre a uh, two-part answer. When I am writing a rough draft, I generally prefer silence, and I prefer now. I prefer my noise-canceling headphones, because music is. I find music so wonderful and powerful that it that it tends to distract me when I need to um, to be putting all my creative focus into uh, into crafting the words, especially if there's something with lyrics. That's that when you're trying to write your own words down, I find it very difficult if I'm just writing a rough draft. When I get to the point where I'm editing, uh, for some reason that flips a different kind of uh, circuit in my brain. And I love to, to edit with 
uh, with soundtracks, with with movie soundtracks. Yeah, they tend to be atmospheric and uh, they rise and fall, and they're supposed to lead you through an emotional journey. So you pick you pick the right tone, and uh, put yourself in that frame of mind, uh, and it it can really uh, just get you into get you into a get you into the zone where you want to be. Yeah. Are you a Spotify? Did. Oh. Spotify. I don't. I have an Amazon playlist, but also for the dark corners of the night, I. Um, it's not. A, it's not a spoiler to say that the the killer listens to a lot of of music, uh, and I was looking for a playlist that might fit uh, this the this person's um, taste. And I was just like googling like weird topics, and finally I hit on like dark industrial metal, and I thought. That sounds like something that would terrify suburban parents. Let me list, let me put together a playlist like this. And that's where I got a lot of the killer's uh, uh, favorite songs. But it turns out it's, it's a wonderful playlist. It's extremely melodic and it's full of angst and drama. And so uh, I could listen to that. A lot of Nine Inch Nails. No, do you still have the list? Oh, well, yeah, I went to Amazon and uh, Amazon oh. Music and then just type in, in dark industrial metal and it'll. it'll okay create a playlist for you <laughs> because I was going to say I'm a big fan of uh I listen to so many different sources but the nice thing about Spotify is I will build a list for this exact same way whether it's rough drafting or I need to build a tense scene then I tend to love you know born identity soundtrack for instance zero dark 30 mm -hmm. Hans Zimmer uh yeah. Tiesto which is high beats per minute and uh, so I, I will often share my my right. my little. If, uh, when you're on deadline and you have an action scene to edit, I completely heartily recommend the Gladiator soundtrack. Yes. <laughs> oh, nice one! Excellent. Um, you're getting ready to have uh, your favorite wine over a very delicious dinner with your husband. You get to invite two friends to the dinner. Uh, living or past, uh, could be writer, could be just anyone. I'm just, who would you invite? Hmm. Uh, I would, I would serve a sense there. And, um, there are far too many people that I would, uh, that I would, uh, love to invite i would uh, since we're in austin i would uh, i would uh, wave out the, i would call to uh, jeff abbott who's another the thriller writer who also lives in austin and uh, he and his family can can bring over <laughs> we will potluck and they can they can bring it in and uh, nice and amanda airward who is also another uh, austin um, austin a writer not a crime novelist but uh, she's uh, was her book the jet setters was a reese witherspoon's pick recently and uh, they're just they're just adorable people that I'd love to spend an evening with. <laughs> nice. Let's see. So you. Uh, oh, and uh, at that dinner, I'm just curious, just because I'm always tuned into music, what would be playing in the background with that delicious wine and those fun people? <laughs> it's a Saturday night. It's summertime. Windows are open. Breeze. Tom going. Petty, the Beatles, Foo Fighters. Um, uh, some of the artists that uh, my husband, Paul Shreve, he uh, runs a, uh, a, a small Americana music label. So we'd be playing some of uh, some of his artists, uh, Rebecca Lobby, Ray Prim and uh, Radio Gunners. And uh, we'd uh, be sitting out on the porch and uh, talking about whatever the next book is we're going to write. I love it. Well, Thank you again for joining us. If people want to get hold of you, meggardner.com is probably the best way to do that, right? Correct. And you're going to keep us posted on when all your fabulous books are going to get turned into blockbuster movies and TV shows. I will, and I will keep you posted on the publication dates for the uh, upcoming novels, and uh, we'll keep going from there. You can find me on Twitter if you want, to, if you have suggestions for stupid crime <laughs> at meggardner1. <laughs> Awesome. Meg, thank you so much for this time. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. Mm -hmm.